Hi, and welcome to the April edition of According to Pete. This time around, I'm going to talk about my amplifier project again. Longest project in human history. And I'm gonna sort of finagle my way around to talking about uh, inductors and motors and such. Uh, how do I get there? Uh, by a mistake, which drives pretty much everything I do. Mistakes, that's how we learn. Uh, last time we talked, um, I was saying, hey, hey, I can run these faders on, on five volts on the DC, right? I tested one out, worked just fine. Uh, and if you recall, um, they're rated, they're actually rated from six volts to 11 volts. So nothing really very convenient for the supply that I have available. So I wired it all up and uh, turned it on and, and guess what? The one works, the other one doesn't even twitch. So the upshot of that is I can't use the five volt supply. So now what am I gonna do? The power supply I have for this thing, right? Is um, positive five volts, plus and minus 12 volts, plus and minus, and positive 28 volts. 12 volts is only a little bit outside of 11 volts, so you could probably drive it with the same supply that's driving the audio, right? Well, that's really a bad idea. Bad, 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 bad. You never ever want to put um, a, a DC motor directly across the supply that runs audio. Um, and, and it's not like this rule is written in a book somewhere, but I'll, I'll explain how this, uh, this is gonna go down. To, to build up to where we're going, let's talk about what happens um, in a conductor, right? In a wire that's carrying current. Let's imagine this is a cross section of a wire made really big. Something called the right hand rule, and to, to exhibit the right hand rule, you go A. And um, what this says is that if you've got current going in the direction of your thumb, all right, and we indicate that with that, that we have magnetic lines of force going around like yay. Oh, that almost looks round. <laughs> as long as that current is going, you have a magnetic field around that conductor. This does not happen instantaneously, okay? The, the, the rise in current does not happen, you know, from, from zero to something and in zero time. Um, the, and it, what it actually looks like, all right, and I'll try to make sure that the whiteboard doesn't fall on me, which it very well may, is something like, yay, okay? And this one will be current, this one will be voltage, this will be time, going that way, and a smiley face curve apparently. At time equals zero, all of the voltage in the circuit that the inductor is in is on that inductor, okay? And as time goes on, the voltage drops and the current rises to its equilibrium state. Um, and this will, voltage will normally go to zero, okay? It depends on the DC resistance of the, of the conductor, but for the sake of this argument, we're gonna say this goes to zero ultimately. It doesn't happen instantly that current goes all the way up. Now the reason that happens is because of this really crazy property of electricity and magnetism. When you get a magnetic field that cuts across a conductor like this, what it does is it induces a voltage in the opposite direction of that applied. That sounds like a lot of words. Um, but basically, if you think about current from T equals zero, current will start like in the middle of the conductor, we will <laughs> assume. And so the magnetic field starts to expand from the center of the conductor. And so what the magnetic lines of force are doing are cutting across this conductor as the current increases. And that causes this resistance here. And so at T equals zero, um, this is actually a very high resistance at very, very low. But this is why you get this kind of action. Now, in a single conductor, you'll never really see this because, you know, it, this property does happen, but it's not apparent. When you stop the current, when you turn the current off, what happens is the field collapses back into the conductor and all that energy that it took to expand that field goes back into the circuit, okay? That ability to store energy is called inductance. And this property within a single conductor is called self-inductance. While this is all cool and, and all, um, when it really gets cool is when you take a conductor like this and you 
<laughs> you make a big coil of wires all like yay and compress them down. That is called an inductor and it does really, really cool things. The inside of a DC motor looks sort of like, uh, let's see, you got a thing here, and a shaft there, and kind of like that. Now this thing in the middle is called the armature, and the armature is made up of a couple of different pieces. Um, and they have permanent magnets inside, okay? Got one that's got, you know, it's north facing this way and one that's got our south. Um, and what they do, right, this is, this is the center shaft. What they do is they wind coils around the frame of the armature. Pretend this is like a si side view, side view of an armature, get this. So this is kind of like, uh, like yay. And the coils go around like this, right? And the, th the, the shaft is secured by the can right there by a bearing, usually a brass thing. And now down here, they have a couple of other little pieces. One's on this side, one's on the other side. Yeah, there's no way I'm gonna be able to draw that. Um, this thing is called the commutator and it's got two halves. Uh, and what they do, is they will have like a coil on one side and a coil on the other, and you can have some, you can have motors with more than one, like three, four, it depends on the motor design. Um, but what they do is they'll take this coil and they'll wire one half of it to this piece, which is, you know, usually uh, copper, and then they'll want to take the other side and go to this piece. Um, same thing for the other coil, right? So they kind of alternate, like one, this one goes here and that one goes there, and on the other side it'll flip, right? And so, what it looks like on the shaft, like an end view on the shaft, the commutator looks like a bad, bad drawing. Uh, sort of like yay, right? And these are conducting, this is like copper. Um, and this one supplies one coil, or <laughs> not one coil, uh, one of the coils will go here and its other side will go here and the other one, same thing. One will go here and one will go here. Now, the gist of how this works is that um, you have what are called brushes that ride against the commutator. And this is where you put power into the motor, right? So you put a plus here, you put a minus here. When this thing starts moving, what will happen is you will induce uh, a magnetic field, right, from the inductor. Cool thing, you get a magnetic field from that. That magnetic field, which is induced, will oppose the permanent magnets that are in the can, and that will cause the armature to turn, okay? When the armature turns far enough, it breaks contact with the brushes, right, at this open spot, and, you know, the size of my brush isn't very good. It's, it's a bad drawing. Um, but the idea is you break contact, and the momentum of the spinning armature keeps it going until the commutator makes contact with the brushes the other way, which induces a magnetic field again, which opposes the magnets, causes the armature to turn, okay? The problem point that uh, I'm most concerned about is when the armature turns and it breaks contact with the commutator, when the brushes break contact. And the reason I'm concerned with that is because, like I said earlier, when, when you stop current going through the, um, the conductor, the magnetic field collapses and it puts all of that energy back into the circuit, okay? And induces a really big voltage spike, in fact. Um, how big? Well, it's big enough to arc from the brushes to the commutator when, when it breaks contact. Uh, and if you run a DC brushed motor like this in the dark, you're gonna see a ton of sparks coming off of this thing. And so that's, that's primarily what I'm concerned with. Now, secondarily, I'm also concerned with how much current that the DC motor runs, right? Because there's no, there's no resistance between voltage source and inductor. So if I were to let it run, if I were to let it sit indefinitely in one position, it's just going to drain whatever source I'm, I'm pushing this thing through that, that, that inductor, which is essentially just a piece of wire. So once you get, you remember the curve I did where it's like this and like that? 
once the voltage goes to zero and the current is maximized, it's, it's really only the DC resistance of that conductor that will limit the current through the circuit. Um, most of the time, motors are running fast enough where it never gets to that point. Um, and this is actually what is stall current. If you hold a motor still and you're just running current through one of the coils, that's called stall current. You're holding it, you're stalling the motor. Um, this, this big arc, the, uh, the spark, the, the, the high frequency, bzzak, that thing that I'm concerned with uh, for running this on my 12 volt supply, um, what can I do about that? Well, if the motor is only spinning in one direction, what I can do is put a diode. Well, it'll be, <laughs> it'll actually be the other direction. Let's pretend I didn't draw it that way. So, um, you know, if I do, if I have this like across my motor leads and I'm only ever going to be driving this motor in one direction, I can use one of these across the thing. And this will keep it so that when the voltage spike happens in the opposite direction, it will forward bias this diode and it will dump the current that was stored in the magnetic field through that thing. And it will limit the, um, it'll limit the amplitude of the noise to 0.7 volts. Um, number one, 0.7 volts isn't really good enough to make me happy. Um, and number two, the motors and the faders have to go both directions. Otherwise, the volume is only going to go up. And while that rocks, <laughs> my neighbors are not going to dig that nearly as much. So what I can also do in, in the case of this, since I've got to have, I've got to be able to run this in both directions, is I can use a cap. So like um, if you have your motor kin here, you can actually uh, take a cap and put this to ground. Oh, this is a terrible drawing. And another cap to ground, right? Because these are going to alternate plus or minus or minus. So you, you do it from the power lead to ground, okay? And in this way, you can generally shunt off a lot of the noise, but I'm not gonna do that either. Let's talk about exactly why I'm gonna stay off of this. The high voltage spike is a bad thing. Um, then there's the matter of uh, the, the motor's going to draw several hundred milliamps anyway. And it's not a constant seven or several hundred million, 700 milliamps. It's not constant, right? Um, every time that commutator breaks with the brushes, current goes to zero or it tries to, and, you know, it tries to put current back into the circuit as the field collapses. So you're gonna end up with a lot of ripple on your power supply. Now, of course, we'd like to filter that with caps, okay? Well, let me, let me illustrate something. For, for a full wave rectifier, um, your ripple voltage, peak to peak, is represented by the current you draw from the circuit times two pi um, F frequency of you know, the ripple uh, times your filter cap, okay? Now I understand that this is not, this is not a direct application, but this is sort of illustrating the point that I'm making. The noise is not coming from the power supply in this case, but this illustrates the whole idea behind ripple on your power supply. And what you see here is that I want this to be zero, right? You, any noise on the power supply of an audio device, that noise is ultimately going to filter through to some degree to what you're listening to. So I want this to be zero on, on my audio power supply. Now in order for that number to be zero, current has either got to be zero, which ain't gonna happen, or my capacitance or my frequency have got to be infinity, okay? So which of these things is going to happen? If you said none of them, now you're getting the picture. This is why I'm not going to put that motor across my audio supply. So that in a nutshell is um, <laughs> DC motor, brushed DC motors and a little bit of inductors. Um, now with all of that lip service, I have covered very, very virtually, you know, I, dude gets doused by perfume at the perfume counter in Nordstrom's and I'm in the coffee shop and I just, Little, little bit, that's how much of motors and inductors we've covered. There's a ton. 
Um, this is just for the purposes of building this amp project. This is why I'm not going to do it. There's a lot more to know about inductors and, and motors. If, if you guys have an interest in pursuing this, say so in the comments or something and we can do it another time. But for now, this is where we're going to stop with this. So what am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, one of our breakout boards and I'm reading it off my screen here. Uh, SKU number is BOB10104. Um, and I'm going to get my fader, my fader power off that. What that board is, is the um, LMZ14203 breakout, okay? Uh, and that little guy, uh, it'll take uh, a wide input voltage range, like up to 48 volts, I think it's, or maybe it was 42 volts. I don't have the data sheet in front of me. Um, but it'll take a really high voltage and it'll act, it'll be a switcher, like a, a buck regulator. Um, and it's pretty efficient, okay? So I can get it off at the 28 volts, eh, like that. Now, that board is set up to switch between a 3.3 volt output or a 5 volt output with a little switch on it, but the schematic, um, Jim Lindblom, the guy uh, who laid that board out, I, as I recall, uh, he was kind enough to put the uh, conversion equation right there on the schematic. So it's a pretty easy matter to alter that circuit to put it, you know, put that output wherever I damn well please. Darn well please. Sorry, family show. Um, and so I'll probably set it for like 10 volts, maybe 8 volts to keep the circuit current, the, the, the drive current a little bit lower. Um, and that's how I'm going to do that. The next obvious question is, can my 28 volt supply drive that circuit? Because I don't expect it is able to put out a lot of um, current. So well, the way we think about this is in terms of power in equals power out, mm, except it's more power out equals power in times some efficiency rating of the converter itself. And so if we put that into numbers, Let's say, for example, I'm going to drive this thing with 8 volts and I'm going to, worst case scenario, if I'm holding both faders still, <laughs> holding both faders still, um, it'll draw 500 milliamps a piece for those things. So 8 volts times 1 amp, right? So 500 milliamps da, 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 equals 8 watts. Okay, so I need 8 watts. The power in to that switcher device is going to have to be um, 8 watts divided by the efficiency rating, which is, uh, if you check the data sheet for this thing, um, it'll say like between 80 and 90%. So I'm going to say worst case 80%. 80%, like yay, equals 10 watts if you can read my writing haha -ha. so next you have um do 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 10 watts divided by 28 volts and just so i don't have to do this in my head 357 milliamps so the question becomes will my 28 volt supply give me 357 milliamps I'm halfway certain that it will. Remember, I can't, I don't have any documentation for this thing. I found it in a closet. And I can also do another trick, which I will almost certainly do. Um, I'm going to PWM those faders, right? And if I PWM them at like a 50% duty cycle or less, uh, and I alternate between the two, I can cut this number in half, right? So I'm looking at 175-ish milliamps to come out of the 28 volt supply. And I'm pretty sure I can get away with that. So that is going to be what I'm going to do. 28 volt supply, that breakout board, and that will drive the faders. So that's where I'm gonna stop. I think I've killed enough of your time for one month. By the next time we speak, next time I speak about this, I hope to be a lot farther along. I gotta have some music in my garage. This is getting old, man. And I really want my sound to be good. And I want it up, I want it now. So until next time, uh, keep the comments and questions coming. You can put them in the comment section below or you can email them to feedback at sparkfun.com with according to Pete in the subject line. See you next time. Bye.